Sabbath cold. All right, Mark Rogers, TV, back with you as we run down uh, some of the top football teams across the country in spring practice, and this was statistically the best defense in the country. Some would argue, based on the schedule, based on the relative mediocrity of the Big Ten, but I'm here to say that, in my opinion, best defense in the country, and I think they showed it against Ohio State against Stanford. Uh, we're talking about Michigan State, and to talk to Michigan State football, we bring in Brian Lee of Bleacher Report. Brian, again, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. I appreciate it. All right, this is the staple of this football program. It's all about defense, and they lose all sorts of talent and not just talent, but experienced guys that really knew the system, knew how to play, were gamers, very tenacious football players. So we start in the middle with Max Bulla, uh, the quarterback of the defense, 76 tackles, missed the Rose Bowl, but he's been so entrenched as the guy at middle linebacker, and now what is Michigan State going to do to try to replace him? Uh, they actually made a surprising move to start the spring. Uh, they moved Tywin Jones, who started on the weak side last year, over into the middle. Um, a lot of people would like to see John Reschke, who's going to be a redshirt freshman this year, I believe, or maybe a sophomore. But he was their highest uh, rated recruit last season. Supposed to be the heir apparent in the middle, which is sort of hallowed ground at Michigan State, where Greg Jones started for three years, was an All-American candidate. Max Bull is there for three years. He's an All-American candidate. It really is the most important part of the defense. And it's the person that he's the extension of Pat Narduzzi on the field. And I think that's why Tywin Jones is there right now. He's a senior. He's 250 pounds. He, he's physical enough to play in the middle. They're going to give him a shot to win the job. Uh, but it should be interesting to see if someone like Reschke can push him in the spring. And if someone struggles on the stronger weak side, then they can start shifting Tywin Jones back to the outside. Yeah, Bola was the heart and soul. Denikos Allen more so the the big play guy who made plays in the backfield for this defense, 16 and a half tackles for loss, five and a half sacks. He's gone, so what are the Spartans going to do to reshuffle things to make up for his loss? Yeah, he's he's uh, currently, currently we've got Ed Davis there on the depth chart. Uh, he's a redshirt junior. Classic, The one of the reasons Michigan State is always so competitive on defense is because they love to redshirt guys, and they love to wait until they're older to throw them on the field, which is why it seems like they're graduating you know, veteran players every season. Uh, Ed Davis is a classic one of those. He knows the system well. Uh, he's backed up right now by Riley Bulla, Max's brother. So he might be the, the 10th Bulla to play at Michigan State. Uh, he, was, he was actually started the opener at running back for him last year. Didn't fare so well over there uh, when Langford broke out. He's back to linebacker now, and those two will duke it out to replace Denico Salen. And that's a great story going back to uh, fall practice of last year, if I remember it correctly, because Mark D'Antonio was just desperately seeking a guy. He had a, court, he had a running back situation by committee. He wanted the guy, and basically one day just decided, Bulla, get over and play some fullback. We're going to give you the football. And all of a sudden, uh, at that point, he was going to play some running back until Jeremy Langford, of course, uh, stepped up and uh, took the reins. But uh, Ohio State's wide receivers were never so frustrated than when they played in the Big Ten Championship game, specifically against Darkies Denard. These guys were used to separating from defensive backs in the Big Ten, but it just didn't happen in the championship game. So Darkies Denard, one of the top uh, cover corners in college football, gone off to the NFL draft along with Isaiah Lewis. So the Spartans, again, going to have to replace some guys that really knew the system and knew what Mark Antonio and Pat Narduzzi wanted. Yeah, definitely. Uh, cornerback's such an important position in this defense uh, because they love playing press man. They love putting them on an island and stacking the box, which is how they're so good against the run, even without great, quote-unquote, great defensive tackles. Um, so Trey Waynes is going to be the number one this year. He was the number two last year. In my opinion, one of the most underrated defensive backs in the country. Uh, he was really, really good last year. I think he's more than capable of filling Denard's shoes as the number one, just as Denard was last season when there were questions about how they'd replace Johnny Adams and whether Denard was good enough to replace him. And then he all he did was win the Thorpe. Uh, on the other side, uh, they've got Darian Hicks there right now. The sophomore the coaching staff really, really likes. Um, 
he's going to get the first crack at it, but then there's a bunch of depth behind him. Ezra Robinson, Aryan Kukun. Guys are going to push each other in camp and kind of just let the cream rise to see who starts across from Waynes. Uh, and then at safety, they've got a lot of depth. Uh, they've got three guys they really trust. Uh, uh, Curtis Drummond's back. He started last year. R.J. Williamson's back. Demetrius Cox is someone uh, Narduzzi you know, famously said he just wants to see get shot out of a gun. He wants it to click one of these days. But he's got a chance to, that's got a chance to be a really good combo of three safeties back there. So I think they'll still be okay, albeit not quite as dominant as they were last season. Okay, Brian, I'm going to push you to sleep with my dissertation on what makes an elite college football program. So when I get done, I'll uh, pound the table or do something to wake you up, and uh, then you can give your response. So basically, I think it needs to sustain time. You have to win more than anything else. You have to pack out the house. So 90, 100,000 people show up. People want to watch you on TV. You produce all Americans consistently, all conference performers. I, to a certain extent was a big detractor of the BCS championship system, so I didn't necessarily give that a whole lot of credit for producing a championship results. So you have to win conference championships, tangibly on the field, be better than anybody else consistently in your conference. Again, Heisman trophies, All-Americans, and win consistently and show up in postseason play and do it for a long time. So we're talking USC, Texas, Oklahoma, Alabama, Ohio State, Michigan, Notre Dame. I think it's a very short list when we're talking about elite programs. More so close to the 2000s, Florida State's jumped into that mix along with LSU and Georgia and maybe a few other schools out there. Now we're talking about Michigan State coming off one elite season and a string of seasons throughout the 7-6 and six in 2012 that were close to elite performance, getting to New Year's Day bowl games, winning 10-11 football games. They've not recruited at an elite status necessarily, but they're producing elite results or close to it over a decent stretch of time. So does this program have a chance to reach that kind of status? Um, I think they do, um, and I think this year will be really important because, like you said, it does take time to be considered that type of program, and in order to realistically do it, for that long, you do eventually need to start recruiting well. You can't always win with the kind of people D'Antonio has been winning with. And the best way to do that, the, the best way to get your name out there to recruit is to keep winning. So right now, I think they're on the radar after last season. And I think that if they can do it again this season, they can really start to gain that kind of momentum, uh, especially the way the schedule shapes up in 2014. They get Nebraska at home. They get Michigan at home. They get Ohio State at home. Um, even if they lose at Oregon, I think most people would forgive that as long as they put up a fight. They're going to be on TV a lot this year, and they're going to be playing home games. And if they can find a way to win the division, which, which will be no small feat given the new divisions where they're in there with Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State if they're eligible, uh, if they can find a way to do it again this year instead of just aberrations of a good year, they can string together last year and another Big Ten championship, even appearance, in 2014. I think there's the seedlings of a potential, you know, at least the level you were talking about, LSU and Georgia. I guess you have to do it a few more years to get up into the Oklahoma-Alabama range. I'm actually going to flip the argument on you to a certain extent because of the national perception of the Big Ten. I think much of it's warranted. I think some of it's not warranted. Uh, at the same time, if you look at the Big Ten performance against the, the top teams, it's better than what you would think. I think it's a bit of group think on the national media perspective. That said, I think the Oregon game is actually, in some respects, more important. Now, in winning conference championships, you got to win the conference, so it doesn't count from that perspective. But in winning over Penn State and Michigan, and even Ohio State to a certain extent until the Buckeyes prove outside the conference that this current team can win big games outside of the conference. Michigan State's going to gain more respect by beating the Oregon Ducks, especially, as you mentioned, on the road. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I just I don't think they need to beat them. I think they need to play well. I want them to beat them. But, I mean, obviously, if they, if they lose by 40 at Outson Stadium and then go undefeated in the Big Ten. 
there's going to be a lot of problems on Twitter for, for Big Ten defenders like you and myself uh, this year. If, if they go to outs in and, and lose by three or seven, which is very plausible given, you know, their most recent common opponent in Stanford who has, you know, train wrecked uh, Oregon the past couple years and who Michigan State outplayed and beat in the Rose Bowl. If, if they can go lo- hopefully win, maybe lose by a touchdown, I think that still does good for the credo of the Big Ten. And I thought you just made a very important connection because if they go off to the West Coast and lose a very competitive game, they can say, hey, at Oregon, very difficult to win there, and we just beat the team that regularly beats up on you. We just did it on a neutral field at the Rose Bowl. So that's very plausible, and I think that's a good argument right there. Unfortunately for Michigan State supporters, this past season they run rough shot over the Big Ten, defeat the team that's supposed to be one of the best in the country in Ohio State, but they had that Notre Dame loss sitting back there. I thought Notre Dame was actually a pretty good football team, but not given the credit. I agree with you strongly. I, th- I think Notre Dame was was very solid, very strong. But again, and that was, if you watch the football game, and unfortunately a lot of people don't watch the games, they see the results. Michigan State had like 83 pass interference calls, many of which were not necessarily the best calls in the world, and they all produced points for Notre Dame. So we could have had a really good debate at the end of the season as to who should have been playing Florida State in the national championship game had Michigan State run the table. But we will never know, and hopefully for Mark D'Antonio and um, the green and white, they will uh, vie for a four-team playoff starting here in 2014. So, Brian, what do you have uh, working uh, right now on Bleacher Report, what are some of those subjects uh, you've looked at recently? Uh, I've been looking at Auburn a lot recently, uh, getting really deep with their spring practices. Uh, some cool stuff going on over there. Uh, I think they're going to be, b- before really looking at them, I kind of thought they were a candidate for regression. Uh, the more I've really looked at it, I, I think that team's going to be pretty scary again next year. I uh, just did a preview of uh what I think will be the top 25, it obviously doesn't matter which 25 teams I put, uh, and previewed, you know, what to watch for in their spring game. So, you know, I've got, I've got a, a cursory understanding of most of the programs right now. Just getting ready for football to start. Only six Definitely. months. I'm right there with you. Brian Lee writes for Bleacher Report. Uh, just ran down some uh, current topics that he's looking at right now. Brian, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate the insight and the information. Hey, thank you so much for having me.